She's out of range. Jamie, yeah. I'll get Jamie to keep trying. You can, you can go and do the minutes. Good afternoon, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome along to this meeting, which I declare open. Welcome to uh, the Honourable Adele Farina, MLC, and also Don Punch, MLA, member for Bunbury. We're just trying to contact Councillor Giles and Jamie. If you keep trying. She's out of range, I think. Would you mind keep trying in a little while? There are no announcements. <coughs> Councillor Jones is on leave of absence. How many is Jones? 4.3, so I'm prepared to move. Councillor Giles participate by phone. Councillor Hayward, Councillor Kelly, all in favour. That's carried. So, Wendy, can you hear me? We'll keep trying. Declarations of interest. Uh, Councillors McGwell and Cook have already declared interest. Are there any further declarations tonight, <laughs> Councillors? Thank you. Can someone move the minutes of the last ordinary council meeting, please? Councillor McGuinness. Seconded, Councillor Cook. All in favour? <clears throat> That's carried unanimously. Minutes of the special electors, special electors meeting. Someone move those? Councillor McCleary, Councillor Hayward. All in favour? That's carried. Wendy, are you there? Hello. Just don't move. We're in session. Minutes of the uh, advisory committees. There are three of those. Someone prepared to move. We receive those. Thank you. Councillor James Hayward. Councillor Kelly. All in favour? It's carried. Yeah, just don't move. Unless you're parked on a bend somewhere. Love this. Do we have any petitions tonight, councillors? We have requests for presentations, deputations. Uh, Don Punch, MLA, <coughs> seeks approval to speak to item 10.1.3, all approving that. Uh, Mr. Alex Karatamoglu wishes to speak to item 10.1.3, those in favour. Mr. Graham Miles, 10.1.3, those in favour. Uh, Mr. Ron Cricky, Bunbury Car Club, 10.13. Those in favour? Lee Spence, President, Bunbury BMX. Those in favour? That's approved. <coughs> um, Bunbury Geograph Chamber of Commerce and Industry, John Saunders. Those in favour? That's approved. And with respect to item 10.5.1, Mr. Seymour requests approval to present. Those in agree? That's approved. Mr. Kim Wilkie. Request approval to present to the same item. Those who agree, that's approved. Mr. Tom Dillon, same item. Those who approve, that's agreed to. And Mr. Don Punch also wishes to speak to that item. Those who approve, please indicate, that's approved. So <coughs> when the time comes to those items, I'll call you up uh, to those various people and you have five minutes each and we'll assist you through that process. So councillors, looking at dealing with the agenda tonight, 10.11 uh, comes out, 10.13, 10.51. Are there any others that anyone wishes to raise? That being the case, can I have someone move the bulk? Councillor Cook, Councillor Hayward, all in favour? That's carried. Councillor Giles, uh, just say aye when I call for the vote. Are you still there, Wendy? We'll pretend she's there. 
So, 10.11. Can I have someone move this recommendation? Councillor Cook, is there a seconder? Councillor Kelly, Councillor Cook. Councillor Kelly. Just to say, Mr Mayor, the proposed, sorry. the proposed new policy applications to lodge by staff or elected members was something that was uh, uh, discussed at policy committee. It was there to protect our staff and uh, it was not seen as being an extra layer of uh, bureaucracy, if you like, but uh, solely something that uh, included um, accountability and transparency for all and a safeguard, as I said, Mr Mayor. So um, I recommend that uh, councillors actually support that. Is there a speaker against? Councillor Hayward. Uh, I'll be speaking against the motion. Obviously, uh, there are already uh, things in place in relation to what the conduct of councillors and senior staff are. What this uh, piece of... Uh, uh, or this motion proposes is that if you have any uh, activity at all, uh, then you are effectively discriminated against in that it has to, every decision, even things made uh, that would normally go straight through for anybody else would need to come back to council. I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily appropriate. There are uh, items in place already through the Triple C and others if there are things that uh, aren't being right or if there's any allegations being made. I just think that uh, elected members and senior staff members don't have to have, I can't see the point of having to have every uh, item that they might bring before uh, to the council for work that would be treated just like everybody else in any other situation have to go through this process. So I'll be voting against it. Thank you. Speaker for <coughs> Councillor Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. My understanding is that not all activities will be uh, reported in this manner, only new matters. So I urge councillors to support this motion. Thank you. I'll put it all in favour, please indicate. Those against? That's lost. We move to 10.13. I'm still having difficulty getting Councillor Giles. Is she still there? Yeah, this is my dilemma, Councillor Steele. I'm trying my best to involve her. Jamie, can you um, just excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we have this little, we're trying to, this is the democratic process where if one of our elected members is a fair distance away from here, the law allows for her to, or him to ring in. We're trying to engage Councillor Giles in this meeting to ensure her democratic process is uh, carried out, but we'll keep trying. Okay. All right, if she comes in and out. What I'll do, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm wondering if there's anything in the rules that talks about a secure line. Excuse me, sorry. There is a thing that says a person has to be in a suitable place, and this is in the... Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. What I'll do when I get to each vote, I'll ask if I can get her. If I can't, uh, she's deemed to be not there and the vote won't be counted. Order, Mr Mayor. Yes, Councillor McMurray. Uh, it would hardly be appropriate for us to ask uh, Councillor Giles to vote if she hasn't heard the debate and it's clear that she's not going to. Yeah, Councillor McCleary, as... Uh, in my position today, I'm trying to engage as many elected members in their democratic right to represent the people who elected them to this position. So I'm working overtime to help her participate. If it doesn't work out, it won't work out. We move on. 10.13. Now, I invite, first of all, Mr Don Punch. Don, would you like to come to the lectern? Um, there's a clock in front of me which indicates five minutes. Takes me back to Parliament, Mr Mayor. We speak quickly. Look, uh, thank you very much, councillors, for the opportunity to address you this evening on the, this issue. Now, when I first um, wanted to speak with you about this, I was actually going to talk with you about the issue of the um, complexity of the last three positions that have been taken to council and the degree of difficulty it is for an ordinary club to actually follow and understand the policy frameworks that council is going to be considering 
I was going to talk with, the uh, talk with you about the application of rates and leases, with many of the members of the clubs already paying rates through their own properties and then having to contribute to rates a second time through their membership fees, and the disparity of rates when they're considered across the board, where, where I know of one not-for-profit paying almost $7,000 in rates for a facility they own and maintain, while others are exempt. The Bunbury residents who've, who are members of that organisation having already paid a rate contribution. I was going to talk about the complexity involved in the, the rates that have been struck. And when you look at them, and there are a number of speakers I know who are going to be speaking to this, an organisation with 10,000 square metres pays potential land fees of $6,000, while one with 11,000 square metres pays 5500 and the discrepancy in size increases with size, with a 55,000 square metre lot attracting fees of 22,000 and 65,000 square metres attracting 13,000. So there's some odd discrepancies in the proposals. And I note that this is the third time that the policy has been back before Council and the degree of complexity associated with this. And I've got to say, when pre-election I was meeting with a lot of residents, the issue around leases and sporting clubs came up as a singular issue. And when I've met with sporting clubs and associations, it's come up again as a singular issue. And the concern around affordability and whether they can actually continue to keep going. Now, that's what I was going to talk about, but I'm going to leave that for other people. What I did want to say was, this afternoon I actually met with a mum. And that mum had a 40-year-old son who committed suicide a couple of weeks back. And she talked to me about the issues of mental health and inclusion and participation in our community and the difficulties that she had. And that was a story that I'd also heard frequently in my meetings with families uh, over the last six months. And this city does have a problem with inclusion and participation. And the one thing that these associations provide is the opportunity for people to feel that they belong, that they participate that they're a part of something. Now, if these organisations start to focus more and more on fundraising to maintain fundamental sustainability and take away the, reason, the very reason why they're operating and why they exist, which is about providing a service to people, about engaging people, about teamwork, about building leadership, about building participation, those are fundamental objectives that I believe this council should be paying attention to. They are fundamental reasons why the state government participates in funding sporting facilities. And it was an interesting discussion that we had that I think some members of this council attended with the Minister <coughs> for Sport and Recreation when he talked about the need to shift from a, a relationship that's based on user pays into relationships based on collaboration I'm bringing organisations together to make better use of the facilities that we have because the, the opportunities for new money into the future are going to be very limited. And that means that council has to have a relationship based on collaboration with those organisations, based on mutual trust, based on mutual obligation. I know that council has a difficulty in making sure that buildings are appropriately maintained and has to manage risk. But that's a shared risk with those clubs and organisations. And I would urge council in considering this to actually fundamentally rethink, is the objective about fundraising to manage maintenance and costs and obligations into the future? Or is it about building a collaborative relationship where the obligations can be shared? And I think you've got some very good contributions that have been made by uh, contributors like Mr. Busher, who argue for moving away from rates and leases and talking about the establishment of a sporting reserve fund. So there'll be other speakers on this topic. I wanted to lay out that ground uh, framework because from my point of view, the engagement and the relationship with clubs and associations is the way to provide dividends into the future. Thank you. Mr. Kerr-Ratamoglu, welcome to you, sir. <laughs> just, we'll just... Mr. Mayor, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight on this issue. And uh, I would like, obviously, to speak against it. My name is Alex Karatanoglu, and I'm here representing the Bunbury Tennis Club, but I would like to think I'm representing more than the Bunbury Tennis Club, rather the Bunbury City. 
And the reason I say that is because, like you, I'm very passionate about Bunbury. We have got a fantastic city, and that's been achieved by all the work the council has done, but a big portion of it by the volunteers. It's a small portion here tonight representing the volunteers. When I see what Bunbury has to offer, I think it's fantastic. But how did we achieve that? Hard work. I can tell you I belong to a lot of clubs in Bunbury and the reason why I do it is I want to contribute and I want to make this place a better place. The PRDC's recommendation is counterproductive. I thought we actually had a resolution to this problem because we have met on numerous occasions with the councillors and we thought we had a solution that was resolved. No one came back to us to address us to say that is not the case and suddenly we saw this proposal. That disappointed me, I've got to be honest, because we spent many hours trying to resolve the issue and I thought we had an amicable solution. So to see this here today is very, very disappointing. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are a team. It was mentioned earlier, teamwork helps. If we are a team, I can tell you, us volunteers are quite happy to roll up our sleeves, do the hard work, go to sponsors and ask them for money and try and improve the facilities for everybody in Bunbury. However, if those same volunteers are going to be penalised by the council asking them that they want more money for the land or the properties or whatever that case might be, that is going to be counterproductive. You are not going to get the best out of the volunteers. Trust me, we need the volunteers, but at the same time we need you. Help us to help ourselves to make this a better place. Don't punish us by increasing the fees and that way frighten our membership away. And I'm not only talking about the Bunbury Tennis Club, I'm talking about all the clubs. We need to embrace them, we need to help them. I urge you today to reconsider this and I plead with you, go with a solution we have already found. And if that is not the best solution, this certainly isn't. We are quite happy to participate in talking and resolving this issue. But as you can see tonight, we have quite a big turnout. People are concerned. They are concerned they're going to lose members. They are concerned they're going to lose the facilities. We have got a fantastic city, fantastic facilities, and it's been achieved by all our hard work, yours and ours. But this proposal is going to be counterproductive. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Graham Miles. Good evening, councillors and Mayor Brennan. Um, I'm here to represent the South West Touring Car Club. Um, we have a, an area behind the um, main grandstand at the speedway that we use for autocross and motorcana. Um, our club was um, established in the 1960s to run touring club touring events on the roads and um, and we've evolved into a, a grassroots motorsport um, club covered by CAMS which is Confederation of Australian Motorsport. Um, uh, we, our, our, all of our members are um, uh, working people um, who, who want to do, do motorsport. Um, the, the track that we use, um, in 2008 we lost the use of our existing track in Benja um, due to the sale of the property. Um, we were offered an area behind the, the grandstand which, we, which had become an illegal fill and dump site um, and we took this on the, on the condition that we rehabilitate it. Um, we did this to establish our track and at the cost of around $100,000. Um, our initial lease um, per year was $4,160 per year, which we, we thought we could cover. 18 months later, we were told we had to pay rates, which I, I could not believe happened, that, that a council can charge its club's rates. Um, our, our, our cost now is $7,180, including rates per year. We do six events a year. Um, this comes up to 
$1,197 per day that we use this, use this area. Um, if this proposal goes ahead, um, our increase will go to $14,790 for the lease plus rates, which comes up to just under $16,000 a year. This will be $2,665 per day that we use this grounds. Um, the, um, before, we move, before we moved to this area, um, we were in, on a peppercorn lease. Um, our entry fees were around $25 per event. Um, and this was enough to cover all our running costs and insurance. Um, at that stage, we had 80 to 90 um, entries per event, um, and um, our, our entry fee now is $75 per event, um, per entry per event, and our biggest cost is our lease payments. Um, we have now come down to about 50, 55 entries per day because people just simply cannot afford to pay it. Um, our club is mainly made up of middle class couples um, with teenage children, often three or four members of the family competing on, on the day. Um, to double our entry fees would just decimate our club. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr Ron Crickey. Welcome to you, Ron. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor and Councillors. I'm here on uh, with uh, the Bunbury Speedway and uh, and the motor, motorsport precinct out there at um, on uh, North Point Up Road. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, pretty much on on the backside of um, the two gentlemen in front of me. I, I agree 100% with what they're saying. And also what I've got to put forward with um, with the way the sporting clubs are here in Bunbury, everyone tries very very diff very very hard at what they do. They put in. They use their own time, there's volunteers, they, everybody's doing the right thing. And to detract from that, if you put the prices up with everything, with the lease and your, and your rates, we have to charge more, like exactly what the guys were saying before me, then they've got to dip in their pockets. They're only working class people. What happens then? They can't afford to come. You have these younger guys that want to get into sport. Sorry, mum and dad can't afford it. They then retract to other things, such as they in the streets. We have a drug problem in Bunbury, it'll promote the drug problem. Obesity and all that sort of thing, because you have to abide by a lot of rules when you do sport and these sorts of things. So I think that's a major concern for the, for the city of Bunbury to have firstly, by rubbing sport out totally, and that's what you guys are looking at doing, uh, is a real major, major impact. You may have a bit of backwash on that, but that's uh, the way I believe it. The Speedway on its own, was um, found way back there, and it was about 40 years ago. Um, the, ca the car club went to the council and asked if there's any land we could have, right, as a place to uh, to put the speedway. And through Dola, the Bunbury City Council said you can have that um, out there at the uh, North Bunbury Up Road precinct, and because it was really useful, it was just swamp land, and out the back of the whole area there between there and the uh, the uh, jail. It is still swampland. It's not no good for anything. So they took it upon themselves to completely build the whole structure at no cost to the council. We don't even get a dump truck out that we get charged <laughs> fees to uh, pick up our rubbish. But anyway, we look after that ourselves. But there's no cost of the, what the council do to look after our venue and venues out there, including the uh, motocross and the uh, go karts. So uh, putting fees and rates up is only going to hurt the uh, hurt the, the sports. Not sport only as ours, but sports, and I think that it have a, a pretty uh, big ramification on the uh, younger people coming through sports in uh, in our CR West. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Uh, Leith Spence. Good evening, all. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to you all tonight. Um, so just from the Bunbury BMX Club, obviously we're a um, not-for-profit club like a lot of the other clubs that are going to be affected by this and um, we run purely on volunteer um, efforts and contributions and um, support from the local community and local businesses. So um, at the moment we're looking at with, with, this, um, legislate, with this lease, we're looking at uh, over a 1,000% increase to our lease. 
which obviously have to be passed on to our members to to um, cover. So um, that's going to increase the cost of our sport considerably. Um, a lot of our members are. We do have a lot of um, single parents with their kids, and we have a lot of families with multiple kids, which um, the cost can get pretty high once you start buying all the gear and paying weekly fees and um, annual membership fees and stuff like that. So um, it'll have a massive impact on all those members. Um, so we've got limited opportunity to generate outside income no facility or function building, no liquor licence, um, just a small public toilet out the front. So basically with our um, racing and our annual events, that's, that's the only opportunity we have to make money apart from um, sponsorship from local businesses. Um, like a lot of the other clubs, there's no real committed cost for the City of Bunbury um, for the BMX club. Um, we're basically self-funded. All our maintenance is done in-house, um, including our monitored security system. Uh, we repair all the um, damage to the facility. We maintain the track. Um, we built the start ramp and all the other infrastructure through um, sponsorship and community involvement, and a lot of time by volunteers. Um, obviously, we still pay rates as well. So that um, in, goes into our costs as well. Um, so over the time, we've developed a world-class facility and world-class track. Um, as you know, we're um, capable of holding national, national titles, uh, which will be happening next year. So, I mean, the track is one of the best in Australia. And um, for the amount of effort that gets put in there um, by the members, and the amount of support that we request or receive from council is pretty minimal for the the um, facility that we maintain. Um, so yeah, again, like the, a lot of the other clubs, we support the local community and um, <laughs> economic growth for the community. We bring a lot of um, tourism down here with. Uh, like people coming obviously from the metro area, but people come interstate, and um, we're, we're going to have uh, international riders coming over here next year as well. So it's a lot of exposure for the um, region. And yeah, it'd be pretty bad if the membership started dropping off because of the increased fees. Um, apart from that, we engage the services of local suppliers for all of our maintenance. Um, weekly operations and events, which involves electrical, there's um, earth moving contractors, there's all those sorts of things that go on around the place, so um, that's all done by local businesses. Um, <coughs> so basically the track is um, it's very specialised, um, we've continued to improve the facility and um, the profitability and membership base every year, year after year. And the facility is tip top, uh, basically just through the hard work of the volunteers. Um, we've got a developed strategic plan, which we work to. Um, and it, incru it includes high level improvements, um, which will require significant funding to achieve. So with the um, Costs increasing all the time. We just it'll make it really hard for us to continue to improve, um, especially if the memberships drop off due to the increased fees. Um, so yeah, to finish up, I'd just like to say that um, this lease increase for not not for profit, 100% volunteer run community <coughs> sporting clubs uh, such as the Bunbury. BMX club and the other clubs that are here being represented, um, I can't see it um, affecting these clubs in a positive way and it will definitely affect the success of the club in the future which in turn affects the community and local business support that we, that we um, provide. Thanks very club. much Lee. No worries. John Saunders. <laughs> Mr Mayor. 
CEO, councillors and staff, uh, how does it feel to be a commercial real estate agent tonight? <laughs> not as simple as it looks, is it? Look, the flat rate system that uh, councillors adopted will not work um, because it takes a, the, into account that every square metre within the city boundaries is worth the same. When in reality, the most expensive real estate in Bunbury is worth 10 times what the cheapest is. So if you put in a flat rate system, what happens is the people on the most expensive real estate probably are paying less than they should. The people in the middle are probably okay. And the people on the cheapest uh, land per square metre pay far too much. And that's the people that are here uh, tonight. The other thing with the flat rate, it doesn't take into account, of course, what the state of the land was when the uh, clubs got it. For instance, the Speedway and the South West Touring Car Club basically got a swamp. And they had to spend considerable amount of money to put all of that infrastructure in. Uh, with the, the Touring Car Club, and particularly the Motorplex, they all share facilities. So to put a flat rate over all of the agreements that are in place, all of those leases have a condition in them from council that they have to share facilities and share the grounds. So to come in over the top of what's already been agreed to in the past and is contained in the leases just simply doesn't work. To run a touring car club event, the touring car club borrows the pits off the speedway, borrows the toilets, borrows the power and borrows their water. Then off the uh, motorcycle club, they borrow the main car park. And sitting on that car park is the youth driver development scheme, which has a lease from the motorcycle club. So you've got all these shared arrangements within there, which work well. When, uh, when we're involved in putting the Touring Car Club uh, in there, we came to an agreement with the council at the time that we'd establish a uh, motorsport committee uh, of all the clubs, and that runs that complex and that does a, just a fantastic job. So we can't go and put a system over the top of something we've already agreed to and is in writing and in, in place. So, and that's why you're having the people from that motorplex in here today. When we're looking at the leasing income, the city is earning about $1 million a year from rents. Uh, we were earning about $114,000 from the not-for-profit sector. And then a number of the clubs had their rents reduced and it brings it back to about $100,000 that we're getting today. If all of the rent reviews were put in place today, we would be earning $118,000. So this whole argument for the last two years is about $18,000. Now, if we go to an appeals process on this, it might be that we get half of that. We then get 109, whereas we're currently getting 100. So we've got all of this argument over $9,000. Now, you tell me how much money has been spent in council over the last three years on staff time and community time to argue over nine to $18,000. Just doesn't make sense, does it? Now, in the, uh, <clears throat> if we do put this through and we have to go to an appeals process, that thing is 17 pages long. And a lot of the clubs are going to struggle like hell to even understand the, uh, the uh, document. And then they have to have the necessary skills to actually fill it out properly. And they've got to have the necessary skills to negotiate with council officers. And then they've got to have the necessary skills to come be before this council and argue their case that they should have their rent reduced. Now, that rent is artificial. It isn't based on any valuations. It isn't based on property values. It isn't based on property law. It's not based on value, uh, property valuations. It is a fictitious figure the council has come up with to meet its budget expectations. So within that document, staff are being instructed to obtain a certain rent. That's their job. Go out and get it. Just as though we instructed a real estate agent, this is what I want for my property, you go and get it, it's your job, and if you can't get it, try and get rent reviews all the way through to bring it back up to what it should be, and that's what this document's about. It also asks questions about what the club is doing about marketing, what it's doing about sharing the site, have you considered amalgamation, what are you doing about getting more members? All of those questions are designed to push the club to earn more money so that they can pay the council's rent. That is the wrong focus for a club to have. 
Clubs are about building our community. John, can so you just summarise? Yep. yep, OK. So this system won't work. We need to go back and sort it out. And from the Chamber of Commerce's point of view, we'd like to see this matter deferred and, and to um, sit down and go through it with the council committee. And I've no doubt whatsoever that we can sort it out and uh, it'll all work as it should. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Oh, yes, Mr Mayor, I'll just refer to um, procedural motion 111B that the debate be adjourned and uh, I'll move that if I can get a seconder. Councillor Councillor. Thanks, Warlock. Mr Mayor, I'll just speak briefly. Um, it's uh, pretty obvious to me as the chair of the uh, policy committee, the policy uh, review and development committee, that the buck stops with us and that we need to uh, ensure that we get this right. Uh, the formula that we've been endeavouring to find for uh, leases um, is uh, all towards accountability. Um, we did not want our staff to have to make subjective decisions about the property that uh, clubs lease and uh, we certainly uh, were looking to reduce risk uh, to them and uh, not have them hang out to dry. Um, subsequently, consequently, we've been working hard on it but we haven't got it right. Uh, so, on that basis, Mr Mayor, I'd like to ask for that this debate be adjourned to the first round after the council elections on the 21st of October 2017. Thank, Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> I'll put that all in favour. That's against. That's carried. Thank you. We now go to 10.51. Wendy, you're hearing everything clearly now? Yes, I am. Thank you. So we have uh, more deputations. Um, I'll just wait for those who want to leave to clear the room. Mr Seymour. Um... Thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge the uh, um, Honourable Adele Farina, the Honourable Member for Bunbury, Mr Don Punch, His Worship the Mayor, Mr Gary Brennan, Acting CEO, Mr Malcolm Osborne, City Councillors and ladies and gentlemen. I truly believe that raising the footbridge will be an outstanding success for the City of Bunbury. The raising of the footbridge 1.4 metres to the same height as the road bridge will create a fantastic entry statement into the CBD and the City of Bunbury, as does the footbridge over the Preston River at the Elup Roundabout. You have noticed that the footbridge is at the same height uh, of the road, maybe even a touch higher. At the same time, this will also minimise the safety hazard that's been raised by the boating community. By raising the footbridge 1.4 metres, it will cater for the city's planning needs for the next 20 to 30 years, as was the consideration for the canal's development over the Collie River. There is overwhelming support from the residents, the business sector of the City of Bunbury, to raise the bridge, not just the boating community. Now is the time to revisit some of these statistics. There is some 6,500 registered boats in the Bunbury and Greater Bunbury area. There are three boat ramps in Bunbury and two of them report under this structure. There are multiple funding options available to raise the footbridge 1.4 metres. There is overwhelming support from the community to raise the footbridge. This will remove the safety risk to the boating community that has been well and truly um, asking for for a number of years. The Department of Transport has given uh, verbal commitment as well as writing um, that they will raise the service bridge over the, over the plug area if the footbridge is raised. There isn't any other facilities of the same um, standard. Keep it quiet out there, please. Just close the door. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, there isn't any other facilities um, of the same um, same level um, at Casuarina at this stage. There's no toilets, no disabled access. Um, 
and the improvements at Casuarina uh, are long waiting for. You know, we are looking and working with all the, the city council and the department to, to get those up and running, but they are at least five, five to ten years away, as we're told. As I said, I truly believe that the raising of the footbridge 1.4 metres will be a great success for the city of Bunbury, showing that the leadership group of the city is in touch with its residents and its community, that it listens and it has, has the ability to act. And this is a willingness to show its initiation to act on change. Thank you. Mr. Kim Wilkie. Welcome back, Kim. Uh, Mr. Mayor, councillors and staff, thank you again for the opportunity for Boating Western Australia to make some further comments in support of raising the height of the footbridge. Uh, not surprisingly, Bunbury has a thriving recreational boating community. Of the 13,393 recreational boat registrations in the southwest region in the calendar year 2016, 2,762 of these were located in Bunbury. Add to this the 2,081 in the Harvey Shire and a further 2,135 of the shires of Capel, Collie and Dardanup, you can appreciate the numbers. This does not take into consideration the 3,459 in Busselton or 9,997 in Peel or the 52,585 in Perth who often take the opportunity to visit. Of this number in the southwest, 13,054 are boats of 8.5 metres in length or less. These are what you'd call trailer boats, requiring a launching ramp and place to park your boat and trailer or car and trailer when using the boat. This figure is growing at a rate of about 5% per year. At the last council meeting, a councillor asked how many boats may be affected if the bridge wasn't raised, and an answer couldn't be given. I contacted Shivers Marine, one of the oldest boat building companies in Australia, for comment and present the following response from the general manager, Peter Harborn regarding boats up to 7.5 metres. As you will be aware, we sell the Quintrex range of boats and also manage our own range of plate aluminium boats. With the Quintex range with a standard canopy, a minimum clearance of 2.4 metres is required. However, with the VHF antenna in the upright position, the height is 2.8 metres. In respect to our own range of boats, the minimum clearance with the target bar and rod holders is 2.6. Aerials then mounted on top of the target bar. The proposed height of the bridge is 2.2. Clearly, these boats will not get underneath it. <coughs> Mention's been made about the new facilities at Casharina, or Harbour. Now, Council, these facilities will be world class and greatly assist the boating experience. They will not, however, replace the facilities in the inlet. They will merely enhance them. Now, this point cannot be overemphasised. They will enhance what's there, they won't replace it. I checked with the Department of Transport, <coughs> they confirmed the number of lanes at uh, Casharina Harbour will increase from two to six, not the four that I put in previous correspondence. However, the additional four lanes when built will only cater for the ever-increasing number of boats. Launching ramps are like car parks. You need lots, and you need them in different locations. Having a total of 14, uh, up from 10, will only just cater for the peak use and the increased number of boat sales in between now and when that facility is built. As previously stated, the boating community at the 135-year-old plus Bunbury Yacht Club have great difficulty getting in and out of the inlet at high tide. Raising the bridge will greatly assist their members, whilst the new facilities in Casharina Harbour will provide opportunities for people with larger vessels to join. Funding the works is not an issue. With only four months left of the project, contingency funds of $406,000 are available, along with unallocated interest of $155,000. If not spent within the scope of the project, which includes the bridge, I would have thought this money would have to be returned to the state. Now, this would be unless a variation of the grant was approved for use on any wish list projects not yet, not yet presented. Um, now, the Mayor's been quoted last week in the paper as saying that he wanted the state government to pay for this if it goes ahead. The reality is they are. This money is all state government money that's allocated for the contingency and as it wishes earned the interest. <coughs> if that wasn't spent, in addition to the council fund, there's an asset reserve of 2.7 million. And with the bridge becoming a council asset, this fund can also be used. 
As with many country areas, the support of local communities in Bunbury is outstanding. And I'd like to reconcile PNC and Sun, Halifax Crane Hire and the Bunbury Yacht Club, uh, who are offering financial support to Council to raise the bridge. Also, the support given by the Honourable Adele Marina MLC, newly elected member for Bunbury Don Punch, and the Bunbury Chamber of Commerce should be acknowledged. For the reasons you have already heard, in support of raising the footbridge to the height of the traffic bridge, I urge you to support this course of action. For those observing this debate, the choice is one of common sense and safety. In fact, 87% of locals surveyed by the South Western Times agreed. The boating community Bunbury and Western Australia hope you will agree with the community. Thank you. Tom Dillon. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, councillors and executive officers, for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm here on a two-pronged attack. I'm representing Mr Colin Piazzantini and his company, and I'm speaking as a long-time citizen of Bunbury. Yesterday, I distributed Mr Piazzantini's letter, which I'm assuming everybody has received. There's no need for me to emphasise the passion that that gentleman has for this city. He's telephoned me again many times yesterday and again today, and this is his statement, Mr Mayor. Whatever it takes, we'll raise the bridge. He and his wife, Anne, are not back till Friday. If negotiations are to take place, my please, my please ask to await for his availability, say on about Monday or thereabouts, and he emphasises that he would appreciate the negotiations with the contributors to be held collectively and with the officers. Perhaps the bridge should have been included in the scope of works from the very outset. But nevertheless, let this be the time tonight for that to be the resolution. There's no time like the present time. Given the thrust by this City Council and others for tourism to be very much on our city's agenda, resolving the raise to bridge by 1.4 metres tonight is absolutely forward vision. Cruise ships, railway back into the city, etc., etc. These agenda items need and deserve positive support and resolutions by Council and all other entities. Bunbury became a city in 1979. Bunbury is the gateway to the southwest. Personally, in my view, and not being from the boating fraternity, and with the view of many other people, is that the inlet waterway is a jewel in the crown of our city. It is slap bang on our CBD doorstep. What I've seen elsewhere in the world, as Mr Piacentini has said, there are countries who would pay billions to tow that inlet over to their part of the world. Three years ago I was in Venice with a stretch, stress fracture in my foot and couldn't walk. My wife was delighted. I was able to sit and watch the water traffic in Venice. I saw gondolas, water taxis, Ferries, vessels carting waste, west vessels bringing supplies in, and oh my God, around the corner came a cruise ship, and there was no drama. Everyone can share waterways. Let me go back, Mr Mayor, to a time when there was a big issue in this city, and I caused it, the forest tree sculpture. Bunbury's contribution to becoming a city in 1979. Bunbury's first piece of public art. For $19,000, my God, that's not going to happen. So this young buck at the ripe age of 38 ran a big agenda. No sculpture. We don't want it. It's a waste of money. Because I raised a furore and there was 400 people supporting me, from $19,000, it got down to 13000 
the lovely mayor of the late day, the late Pat Usher, rang me and said, Mr Dillon or Councillor Dillon, what about the silent minority? I changed my vote. The sculpture's there. I'm told it's worth somewhere around about a million bucks. Motorised vessels in the inlet. There's upgraded boat ramps. They're magnificent and they were expensive. There's regulated speed limits prevail. I saw today a sign, no jet skis, thank God. There's restricted access for oversized boats. I remember the Valdemir going up to Turkey Point. I remember Mrs Smith with her dolphins. Everybody in Stirling Street and Austral Parade had a jetty and a boat. Mr Mayor, the contributions by Piacentini, Halifax Cranes and the Yacht Club is in the vicinity of $140,000. There's enough money saved there to do the abutments. I'm from a craneage background and I'm from Earthworks. Tom, uh, can you just sum up now? I'm going to say, Mr Mayor, once again, thanks for the time. Raise the bridge, raise it tonight and Bunbury will be better for it. Thank you. Welcome back, Don Punch. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Thank you, councillors, and thank you once again for allowing me to speak in support of a motion to raise the footbridge. There are two issues that fundamentally affect the navigability of that area. Tide streams, which hasn't been mentioned, but the narrowness of that cut makes it a very difficult situation in strong tide currents. That makes it difficult from a boat handling point of view, and the bridge height of 2.2 metres. And together, they make it a very difficult proposition for everyday people with very modest craft to navigate the cut. Looking at opportunities to remove the risk factors is an important consideration in terms of how we manage the waterways. And when we look at the waterways, from really from Dawesville down to Port Geograph, Bunbury is the only protected area in that whole coastline. It is an incredibly active wave climate coastline. There are a number of areas along that coastline where people do attempt to launch boats off the beach, but it is a pretty difficult proposition. Um, when we look inside Bunbury itself, the existing facilities out of the inlet, we do have Casuarina Harbour. The facility there is based on a very narrow walkway, piled, and it's subject to tide height. So for people who've got any degree of infirmity, it's a very difficult proposition to tie a boat up at low tide if there's a wave climate and then climb up onto the walkway itself. So while it is a useful um, slipway, it is a difficult slipway for many people. The estuary is in calm water, but there's a distance issue, and the Department of Transport clearly take the view that the cut is not a navigable waterway. And there are, we know there are difficulties with the wave climate there. And that leaves the inlet as the, really the only place of certain calm water in the Bunbury area. It has floating jetties, it has ease of access, it makes it a very easy proposition for the elderly, for any people with any degree of infirmity, to enjoy boating. And most of the people who are using those facilities are very modest boaters. Now, Casuarina Harbour is a good opportunity. It is about four to five years away, and there will be six lanes as part of that development. But in my view, that will not meet entirely the forecast demand and growth that we have, not only in Bunbury, but in the greater Bunbury area, because we draw boaters from that whole area. It is not just the city of Bunbury, and I know that's a problem for the city of Bunbury, but the reality is that for people who are boating really in a circle from Harvey down towards Capel, this is a location to come out. Now, there will be a problem. I think we've heard some discussion this evening about multiple uses and lots of boats and activity, etc. But that, that can be a problem, but it can be managed, and it can be managed with an appropriate management plan for the waterway. And in my view, there's a discussion to be had with the Department of Transport in terms of taking responsibility for that. And that can govern boat speeds, boat locations, anchoring locations, and no-go areas in terms of protecting the mangroves. In essence, I, in my view, DOT, the Department of Transport, have indicated agreement to raise the structure through the, the notes in the briefing note uh, in relation to the, um, the actual storm surge gates. So they're making a contribution to this project if Council decides to raise the footbridge. So that being a constraint, uh, I think it's quite clear the Department of Transport are going to address that. From my point of view, 
This is one of those decisions which is a focal point. Council can decide to do nothing about it and leave it as it is, put it back, and it will be a running sore for a long time and it will spoil what is a very good project in terms of the management of our waterways. Or council can do something constructive in my view and actually make a positive decision that it will address the needs of people. There are far more people who will be supported by a decision to raise that bridge than there will be people who are offended by leaving it in situ. The state governments, the previous government and this government, is about to commit somewhere over $110 million by the time the whole waterfront project is complete. And I even have a sense that it may be a bit more than that. It is a pretty significant contribution. And this scale of project is a pretty small price in that whole scheme of things. And council staff have identified meaningful ways to fund it. For the point of view of creating harmony in our boating community, providing a good service for people, particularly those people who have a bit of difficulty managing their boats, but for whom their boat is a passion, of very modest means, let's make the most of those jetties that Council have put in, that are excellent jetties, make the, cup more, make the plug more accessible, remove the risk for people, and put the enjoyment back into boating, because I know that many people break out in a sweat when they go through that plug. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so, councillors, tonight we have um, some modified options which has been circulated by the acting CEO. I'll just ask the uh, acting CEO to go through those so everybody's clear. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the modified options are actually up on the screen. What we have uh, looked at is the options that were contained in the original agenda item. Um, under option one, we've added in the uh, authorisation for CETA to negotiate with those parties that have made offers of support. And um, also a thank you to those organisations uh, from council. And option two and option three essentially read the same. We've just changed the wording on part two which now reads to f that council would fund the works from unallocated interest received, etc. So there's no further changes to part two. Again, part three on both options two and three, authorising the CEO to finalise negotiations with those parties that have offered assistance and also thanking those parties that have offered that assistance to this particular project. And can you just explain why we need an absolute majority for option two and three? Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Options two and three will... Um, potentially see funds uh, being taken out of the reserve account and it's not an allocation that's been considered in the adopted budget so therefore require an absolute majority from council to do that. And for those who don't know an absolute majority is seven. Seven have to support it. So I'm in your hands councillors. Councillor Warnock. Option Sorry one. sir I was on my feet first. Is there a second to Councillor Warnock? Yes, Mr Mayor, I'll second that. Councillor Warnock. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Deciding whether to raise the footbridge or not has certainly been a challenging process. Um, point and of I order, sir, that when a person stands on their feet in this chamber, it's usually the person first on their feet that passes what motion they want to ask the council to pass. Councillor Stick, take a seat. Carry on. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Deciding whether to raise the footbridge has, or not has certainly been a challenging process and I've heard robust arguments from members of the community for and against this. For those who've never been a councillor, our budgets take months of discussions, workshops and deliberations because we simply cannot cater for the projects that we would like to. We prioritise projects based on the greatest need and benefit but there are always projects that don't make the cut and are in the queue. Being on the Transforming Bunbury's Waterfront Steering Committee, deciding on what can be funded with the $12.6 million that was allocated to the Combana Foreshore de redevelopment has been a huge challenge. With funds set aside to construct a new footbridge, we sought opinions from the boating clubs about whether to raise it or not or leave it at its present height. When the majority of the boating clubs said they didn't want it raised last year, Sorry, the no. council voted no to it. When the steering committee was deciding what couldn't be put in the Kambana Bay redevelopment, one of the things that was left out was a patrol tower for the City of Bunbury Surf Life Saving Club. 
I personally struggled with the fact that as a council, we had asked the Surf Lifesaving Club to patrol the beach, particularly in light of the amount of residents who occur there and the increasing number of visitors that are sure to flock there once our new amazing developments opened in January, but that there was nowhere for them to operate from. We were order, told that it might be able to be funded. Order, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're talking about the raising of the bridge, not the life saving club. Yeah. Yeah. So we on. were told that it might be able to be funded if there were any leftover contingency, but not to hold our breaths. So this club, which spends every weekend saving lives on our beaches, patrols without a facility to operate from, and lugs its equipment from its headquarters on Back Beach. This year, the Ever Industrious Surf Club has managed, through sheer determination, to Point gather eighty thousand dollars. It's consistently, dollars consistently about the, the the club. This is not about that. Councillor McCleary is right. I'm happy for Councillor Warnock to continue. Just Thanks, I can Mr. see Mayor. the connection you're making between the ex extra money and whatever. I'm just talking about the but contingency Councillor funding. Warnock, bring it back to the footbridge. Thank you. Sure. So. Just to, su just to sum up the surf club stuff, it's still in the queue for any money left over from the contingency fund that, that officers have asked us to look at. Yep. There is a queue. One of the Where options we've been None given by our finance queue. staff is to fund the raising of the bridge. Mr Mayor, Council on my Warnock, point of carry, order, carry can we on. have a bit of respect Council in the chamber? Warnock. Council Warnock. Councillor Steele. Take a seat, please. Councillor Warnock. I ask all elected members in a very emotional subject to have respect for each other's views as per the code of conduct and I will conduct the meetings. Thanks Councillor Warnock. Carry on. Thanks Mr Mayor. One of the options we have been given by our finance staff to fund the raising of the bridge is to dip into the asset management reserve. This is a reserve that over the next 15 years will be $37 million short. That means we have an alarming problem in that we cannot fund the upkeep of our parks, sporting club buildings, roads, footpaths, stormwater drains, and the list goes on. I certainly do not want to add to this $37 million problem any further. If we keep dipping into this, the $37 million problem is going to get progressively worse. The other option we've been given is not to include CCTV, Wi-Fi, and an entry statement into our waterfront, all standard features of any new development. Already, we've had to leave out some of the lighting that was originally allocated. That's in the contingency funding queue as well. At the moment, the amount of funds being used from the contingency fund is proportionate to how the project is tracking, i.e. we are halfway through the project and 50% of the contingency funds have been used. And that's why I've been told not to hold my breath on money for a surf club facility. What if we use the contingency funds so that there is nothing left for any unforeseen expenses that arise and our officers have to come back to the council and ask for more funds to complete our waterfront development stage one. We have two businesses in our community that have come forward and offered financial contributions toward raising the bridge. Unfortunately, it still leaves a gap of about $200,000 and I'm not comfortable using ratepayers' money to do this for the reasons I've outlined. By undertaking this process of looking into costings, we have given all interested parties the opportunity to be heard. Unfortunately, this has resulted in delays, and the footbridge would have just about been ready for walking on by now, but now it will not be open until after Christmas. So looking at the list of projects that we need to fund in the budget each year, the very worthy projects that have been queued up on the contingency funding list for a long time, the clear message by the majority of boating clubs that they don't want the bridge raised, I must weigh all of this up and go with what will deliver the most benefit to the most people, and I would ask councillors to please support option one. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, sure, Mayor, councillors, um, every decision we make in this chamber is important. Um, some decisions are straightforward and easily made. <clears throat> Other decisions are more complicated and resolutions difficult to determine. There are always two sides to any story, and that's why this chamber exists. So whatever the case, elected members, the Mayor and councillors, represent the interests of all ratepayers, electors and residents of the district. They are sworn to make the best and fairest decision for everybody. It's vital that councillors weigh up all information and consider all the facts. So in this case, 
the Bumba Yacht Club has been quite loud in its support for raising the Kumbana footbridge, and they've made their point. Alternatively, there are many other users of the Leshnolt Inlet who equally, equally have the right to be heard. They are the rowing club, the dragon boaters, the paddle boarders, the light sail craft, the passive users of the inlet, and as I've said before, the health and well-being of the inlet itself. And listening to the speakers, Mr Mayor, including Mr Wilkie, who was talking about bigger boats, uh, joining the Kumbana Yacht Club. Sir, Every Mr Wilkie did not say that. He did take, not say there would be bigger seat, boats. Carousel, Stick. Carry on. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Every stakeholder is free to present ideas and express opinions and identify risks or suggest changes, but not every stakeholder can be a decision maker. This council is the elected body that makes decisions and it's with a view to the outcomes of the community and the community and what they want to achieve as a whole, and that is all of the electors and the ratepayers, including those people I mentioned as users of the inlet. The decision to be made here tonight is about widely contrasting interests, and we've heard some of those. We've heard the Yacht Club, and we've also heard the Rowing Club, and we've heard others who don't want the footbridge raised because they don't want increased traffic into this shallow tidal inlet, which, as Mr Dillon pointed out, is a jewel. So... Our objective, again, must be to balance the interests of the different stakeholders. And there are many stakeholders. This is just not one-sided. So I've looked at the facts and I've heard from many people. I've had it in both ears, which is good. Gathered as much information as possible to assess the options put to us. And what we hold is true is, is that the Council's decision must be compatible with competing values and opposing interests. So weighing up the possible outcomes, the pros, the cons, the opinions and the feedback and other natter. So ultimately, when there are mixed views, you must ask, well, what's the status quo? What is the status quo? The present situation on the Leshnault Inlet is one of mixed use. And whereas change might be desirable for the Kumbana Bay Yacht Club, Kumbana Yacht Club, it is not acceptable to the rest of the inlet users. And we've heard that. We've been told by the other users of the inlet. No, we prefer not. On that basis, it's not right to encourage an action raising the bridge that would disadvantage the many other legitimate users of the Leshnault Inlet. As a result, I believe the right decision is to maintain the status quo. So I'm supporting option one on the basis that we just don't represent one side. We represent the other side as well, and we also represent the Leshnault Inlet as a passive recreation area knowing full well that it will be used by the current users, the boat users, for as long as that takes. It just will not increase further traffic into the inlet. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Speaker against, Councillor Stick. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to throw a wild card here. I'm going to say let's not make this decision here tonight at all um, if it goes against raising the bridge. I've got a motion on notice to say that, so I'm putting it out there to say, look, if we don't come to the resolution to bring this to... Um, 1.4 metres height, don't build it. Save your money. And when you want to talk about contingencies and waiting lists, the reality is there is no such thing. Any money that is saved through you, Mr Mayor, has to go back to state government, coffers. Everybody knows that. This project was funded for what we requested. If it hasn't been enlightened to exactly the funding, it goes back to state government. Perfect example is a bus at an airport. There's your example. Now, if you have a look at the numbers of voters and the growing amount of them, and which is, you know, the 13,500 that are already existing and the 5%, think about <coughs> jobs. Think about the spray painters, the marine electronics, the marine um, engineers, the, the boating fraternity that creates, you know, more jobs with sales assistance. Sales itself, meaning sales representatives. We need jobs in this city. And if you go cull the capacity for visitors to come here, then basically you're saying, A, you don't want tourism in this city for the next four to five years, and B, you don't want jobs here for the next four to five years in the boating fraternity. It's that simple. It's clearly that simple. Now, 
if you want to talk about the Surf Life um, Saving Club, I gave them $1,000 out of a discretionary fund for a, a defibrillator, which this council dumped the discretionary funds. So that's the only thing I'm going to mention about the Surf Club and the fact that they do great work. But if you want to talk about um, preconceived um, dipping in of council set-aside money, we've already done that. The CBD parking fund. We dip in that for marketing purposes. So we've already had a president set. And the other thing that no one's even bothered to mention is that we already have an ongoing cost. It's called landscaping, water, electricity. None of those costs actually appear in any of the documentation thus far. So who are we kidding ourselves to say that we haven't got an ongoing budget expense? Because we do. Too right, we do. And the other thing is, raising the bridge is not going to give a recurrent cost because it's a one-off cost. A one-off cost. For, um, and if you want to take it out of the asset fund, that's what the fund was for. Why would you go back four years or three years or two years, like one of the speakers said, it's going to be a thorn in our side or something along the lines of that? Why would you go and then rip it back up within 18 months to raise it then? Because you know you clearly have a problem within the boating fraternity to access safe boating facilities. And for those people who have a, a disability. Where do you think you're going to take them? Because it's clearly unsafe at the moment. And another wild card for you to think about is the government of the day has authority to do um, what it wants to do when it comes to development. If it wants to, it can create a Bunbury Redevelopment Authority. I've actually mentioned it before, probably about three years ago, four years ago. And quite clearly, if the government wants to do that, it can do that. And that inlet, as you say, may be mixed use, but those parcels of land in there, if they become part of the Redevelopment Authority, the government can do, do and develop any height they want in there. So when you want to talk about adding boats and you want to talk about adding tourism, you want to talk about adding jobs, Government of the day has the authority to do it. So your decision-making forum in here can actually be the start of the death of you, of that inlet and what the capacity is for it to have. So I urge councillors to really reconsider their vote because, quite frankly, um, the contingency funds are there, $406,000 at this point. And if you don't know where the contingencies are going for the next six months, well, then perhaps, you know, we have to re-look at um, the governance of what we spend it on. And I did ask, I did ask for a um, workshop on this. And to, the, to this day, we don't know where all the contingencies have really gone. And so how, we, how can you make a real decision if you want to talk about contingencies? Plus the unallocated interest of 155,000. We clearly can do it today. Today's the time to do it. Key speakers have said that. All the community knows that. And there might be some people who will be angst, but guess what? We have to do this today. So I urge you to vote this down and if you want to reconsider, vote for option three. And if not, then go for my motion on notice and don't do anything at the moment until we can afford it. Speaker four. Councillor Warnock to close. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Look, I don't think there's anything that's left to say. I think, uh, I think we've said it all. I will pick up on a, on a couple of points. Um, if, if, we do, if we do nothing, um, I um, have been asked on behalf of Holly Lang, who represents 450 members of the uh, community who campaigned very hard a couple of years ago to, lift the bri to, to get the bridge reopened. And basically, if that, if that bridge is left, um, with no access, people are forced to go up onto the road on the footpath. Now, there was a great deal of concern with safety. My, my own dog cut its paws on there, $1,000 later at the vet bill. Wheelchair, um, people in wheelchairs cannot access that pathway. And I've been asked by her in, in, in no uncertain terms to please put, a, put across um, that there will be huge issues should, uh, should that bridge not, uh, not be constructed. Um, so just in summary, I'd urge um, all councillors to support option one. We don't have the money, we don't have the budget to do this, and it's unfair to ask the ratepayers of this community to pay a couple of hundred thousand dollars 
um, to, to raise this bridge. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. I'll put it. We're looking at option one. All those in favour, please indicate. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's lost. So, Councillors Steck, Cook, Steele, Morris, Hayward, McCleary. The rest were four. I'm in your hands, Councillors. Councillor Hayward. I'd like that. to second, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Hayward. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Mayor. Uh, we've heard uh, this, this uh, argument's been quite divisive. We've uh, heard a lot of arguments on both sides. I've heard them as well. Some of those uh, things I agree with them, uh, others I don't agree with. But what's important today is that we make a decision and get this finalised. We've had a go... Uh, on, uh, last time I got up and spoke, I encouraged Council not to go down this uh, path because I didn't believe we had the finance. However, I also made it very clear that I wouldn't support it unless I believed that there was good, strong community support. Since then, we've had uh, the offer from the, um, the Yacht Club, which we take on good faith. We've had the, the offer from Peace and Tini, and, and we take that on good faith, and also from uh, Nick DeMarty as well. Those are significant community contributions. Uh, and with the interest that potentially we have available uh, to us, the 155000 plus the community uh, amounts that uh, are pledged towards this project, we have a situation that means that we can make the decision to raise the bridge to the 1.4 metres uh, without it costing us the half a million dollars it was set to cost us when this was first proposed. Um, I would like us to remember that we need to define what we're deciding about today simply being about raising a bridge. We've heard all sorts of arguments about economic benefits, about uh, you know, safety uh, to the extreme and others. Today's, tonight's decision is not about any of those things, largely. It's about making a decision about whether we spend the couple of hundred thousand dollars that we need. We've been shown through um, the work that our officers ha have done uh, that it is possible and I think we should support it. I'd also like to say, Mr Mayor, that right from the outset, the Council's done, as far as I'm concerned, a very, very good job in dealing with this matter, despite the, some of the feedback that it has had. Um, and we are making a decision late in the day, which is really unfortunate, because we haven't had the opportunity to make the best decision we could have made if we'd had all the information uh, and if we'd had the amount of public debate that we've had recently right from the start. We would have made a different decision, I believe. Mm. However, that's water under the bridge, pardon the pun. Uh, we need to make a decision now to finish this and to get this done, and I urge all councillors to make a decision to support this so that we can, we can have this done, move on, and get on with governing our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I've been a councillor for 10 years, and over that... 10 years, we've talked about whether a person can have a peacock in the backyard, and we've discussed the issue here for about an hour and a half. We have talked about uh, people, whether they can have a transportable in the backyard for a shed. We've talked about rezoning, and we've talked about the height of parapet walls. But every once in a while, an issue comes up that actually deals with life and death issues. Now, we're talking about raising a bridge for 1,400 mills that can, in fact, cause a decision that could be as life and death. I'll give you an example. When I was doing some, making some toffee at the shop, I look out over that area that when we get a northerly wind, that northerly wind pushes the water into the Kumbana Bay. And the ocean level actually rises. Now, 
it's not, we're not talking about a major storm. We're talking about a sea surge just from wind that's coming from the north. There's somebody coming from Perth. Clear weather. But they know later at night there's going to be a storm coming in. They know they're going to make Bunbury. And they need some place to actually go in for a harbor, a safe harbor. Now, if they're traveling from Perth and coming down, and that northerly wind's blowing, and the sea level rises, they cannot get under the bridge at the level that it was and we're looking at keeping. They can't get in to safe harbor. Where do they go? We've been told that they can't go into the cut unsafe in terms of traveling going through the cut. We can actually put people's lives in danger because they're not going to have a trailer to be able to lift it out. That's the difference right there. We're talking about an issue that is life and death. We're talking about an issue as well that we have put a great deal of money already re-establishing the launches on Sterling Street and next to the Powerboat Club. We've put the money there, and it's to be used to be able to get in and out of the Leshnault Inlet. The Honorable Member from Bunbury, Mr. Punch, was absolutely correct. We can regulate in relation to what can be used and the speed limit and the uses within the Leshnault Inlet. We can do that. All we're asking for is that we have a bridge high enough for people to save lives. Full stop. That's all it is. Let's raise that bridge and save some lives. Thank you. Speaker against. Now I'd like to propose an amendment to the, um, the option. Councillor Kelly. Two out of five, that the City of Bunbury write to the State Government to reinstate regulation or orders on the Leshnold Inlet through the Waterways Conservation Act. 1976. Yeah, I've got one too, Councillor McCleary, but you go right ahead. Thank you, Mr Mayor. What does that actually mean? Because I don't know. Thank you. <coughs> um, Councillor Kelly, would you just explain the implications of that? Perhaps I might get a second to first, Mr Mayor, so I can speak well, to you. I, I well, I haven't accepted it yet, so... Uh, but All right, Councillor Warnock, you're, you're seconding that. Go ahead, Councillor Kelly, just to explain what that means. OK. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, back in 1976, the government of the day uh, uh, put through Parliament the Waterways Conservation Act of 1976. That Act of Parliament uh, allowed the establishment of uh, inlet management authorities. There was a Peel Inlet Management Authority, Leshnold Inlet Management Authority, Wilson Inlet Management Authority, uh, Albany Waterways uh, Authority and also the uh, Swan River Trust. Uh, the reason for the Waterways Conservation Act, Mr Mayor, was to establish these authorities to protect the values, uh, environmental values and use of waterways such as those five waterways that I just mentioned. Uh, some time ago, uh, in its wisdom, a government of another persuasion decided they didn't like uh, management authorities and management authorities were abolished. And what in effect happened is, is that the Leshnold Inlet, along with the Albany Waterways, the uh, Wilson Inlet and the uh, Peel Inlet became orphans. In other words, they didn't have uh, a management system to protect them against uh, the increased use uh, that's come about by increased population. So um, I'm quite sure that uh, the local member would be very keen to protect uh, the inlet uh, by use of that Waterways Conservation Act and uh, will be very keen to pursue to protect the inlet uh, the re-establishment of a Leshnold Inlet Management Authority. Alternatively, the government may decide that they would like to vest that with the City of Bunbury or some other body so that we can protect the inlet uh, from the inevitable increased traffic that is going to occur. That's in a nutshell, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Kelly, while you've been speaking, there's been a bit of wordsmithing going on, so would you just have a quick squeeze at that, please? 
Sorry, sir, can I ask a question? Just hang on a second. I'll get, come back to you, Councillor Steck. That seems pretty good, Mr Mayor. Are you happy with that, Councillor Warnock? Yep. Councillor Steck, question? Um, sorry, sir, but this, this um, amendment refers to some kind of um, environmental problem and issue with the inlet when clearly, clearly we've already gone down that path and there was no environmental issue to be found. So what's the necessary of putting this um, extra clause into the motion? Yeah, well, Councillor Steck, what you can do is speak against it and vote against it. Is there a... Councillor Warnock, do you wish to speak to it? Uh, just quickly, thank you, Mr Mayor. I think if we are going to go down the road of raising the bridge and, the, and this motion gets up, we need to ensure that we have all the protection um, that we need in order to um, fulfil the requirements of protecting the inlet. As, as um, the member for Bunbury said, um, you know, there are things we can put in place to, to manage the inlet, so I think it's imperative that we have something on which to act under. Thank you. Speaker against? Councillor, <coughs> uh, Councillor Miguel. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, excuse me if I break into a kid of, uh, fit of coughs in a minute. I haven't been too well. Thanks for that, Mr Mayor. Um, just on this matter, obviously I've been quite through it. I was initially in favour of um, of keeping the, the bridge at the same same height. I'm not going to get into the reasons behind that because it's been it's been debated now. Um, Democracy has run its course, in my opinion, and this, this council has voted to raise the bridge well. Effectively, that we will be in a minute. So I think this is just mudding the, the waters, although I can see some of the intent, um, Councillor Clay. I just don't... I think let's just make this decision, get it done. It's dragged on for too long. Um, let's deal with it now, make the decision, and then for whatever new, we can do that later, because I don't believe this has anything to do with raising the bridge, um, and that's why I think we should just vote on this and get it, get it done so we know crystal clear what, what we voted on and what we've done, and the whole night's finished. Speaker 4, Councillor Kelly. Oh, just, to close, I assume we're just, going to, uh, on just the amendment number 5, yeah. Thank you, Mr. I'll put it all in favour, please indicate. Yes. Three, those against. <coughs> That's lost. In that case, Mr. Merrill, the, uh, the, uh, just excuse me for a second. Councillor Steele's requested that the votes be recorded. There was... Um, Councillor Kelly, Warnock and Giles supporting that amendment and the rest were not supporting it. So, Speaker. Yeah, Mr Mayor, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to speak once again um, for uh, the other stakeholders involved in this, the Dragon Boaters, the Paddle Boarders, the Light Sail Craft, the Passive Users, and as I've said before and as I was indicating in number five, the health and well-being of the Leshnold Inlet. Raising the bridge will increase boat traffic. Uh, there's no doubt about that. That's the intent of raising the bridge. And uh, unfortunately, with some boat owners who are a little less responsible than others, um, who don't know much about boating, uh, there will be inevitably accidents away, along the way. Um, that's, that's just a fact of life. That's the way of the sea. Indeed, uh, as we all know, a master is in charge of uh, the master's own vessel and responsible for its safety. However, it doesn't always work that way. Um, I think that uh, I've, um, I've defended the inlet, I've defended the, uh, uh, the passive users, the other users who have spoken to us. I know a number of us went along to the rowing club and heard Mr Nowland and others speak. Um, I think that uh, as it goes, we're going to spend half a million dollars uh, of somebody's money, ratepayers' money, taxpayers' money, uh, to raise the bridge. Inevitably, there will need to be some action taken on the management of the inlet because currently it is an orphan. There is no regulation there to look after it and inevitably there needs to be action from this. I'll vote against this. I'm quite happy to do that uh, as being a voice for the other people who have spoken to us uh, and uh, not here tonight, but uh, unfortunately it doesn't look like they'll be heard. So uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Speaker 4, Councillor Steele. Hayward and Councillor Morris accept this. I'd also like to just add one word to number three, which would read, um, authorise the Chief Executive Officer to negotiate collectively with all parties who have offered to assistance, if the mover and seconder are happy with that. Are you happy with that, Councillor Hayward? Uh, I just have a question. Yep. Just through to the CEO. Is the CEO Stand happy up. to... Thank you. Is the CEO happy to do that? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, we will, uh, we're happy to meet with the donors collectively 
uh, they may also wish to have individual meetings which will um, also convene if necessary. So it's very flexible. I'm happy to... Are you happy to accept that? Okay, so we're okay. Thanks, Councillor Steele. You're speaking for... I sure am. Um, thank you. I think we've got a few facts that we need to also um, think. The money that we have already in the contingency is 406000 as already has been said tonight, and the interest unspent, is, which it totals $561,000. This exceeds the amount that we're asking to raise the bridge for $499,000. So everyone's scaremongering and saying that the ratepayers are going to be you know, really out of pocket, I think we have to look at, we actually do already have this money. I just wanted to make that point. I've, um, I think everything else has really been said tonight with the speakers and the four people that have um, spoken for. So um, I will leave it now to if anyone help wants to speak against. Speaker against. <laughs> Councillor Hayward. I'll put it all in favour, please indicate. Those against? That's two two against. That's carried. And the two against were Councillors Warnock and Kelly. The rest were in were in favour. Mr. Mayor, I am on my feet. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting to the next item. Thanks, Councillor Cook. Are you requesting leave of absence? No, Mr Mayor, I'm wondering about the status of 8.41. I'm not sure that we've dealt with that matter. 8.41, have we... Jamie, bring that one up, please. <coughs> 8.41. Didn't we do that... Okay, councillors, um, we overlooked 8.41. It's in limbo. Okay. Councillor Steele. Do you want to second it? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll second my own report. Anyone speak against that? All in favour? Go on, councillors vote. This is for the uh, Councillor Cook's report. That's carried unanimously. I want to leave absence next week. It's done. Um, Councillor Steck, your motion now seems to be uh, not required. So are you withdrawing it? Yes, sir. That's withdrawn. Councillors, thank you so much for your composure, your understanding and your respect tonight. I declare this meeting closed at 7.02pm. Thanks, Wendy.